All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you everybody for coming today. We'll have a few more join us throughout the probably this next little bit of uh, entry time as well. Um, we are going to go over everything regarding UASIS that we have inside of the system. This uh, webinar will be a condensed version of what our trainings have been over the last couple of months. Um, so if you've attended those trainings, this will be a repeat. You may see a couple of new things as we have put a few new things in there um, over the last few weeks, um, but most of it will be about the same. Um, we are have a lot of information to get through in the next two and a half hours. Um, this meeting will go until 3.30. We will end as close to 3.30 as we can. Um, if you would like to follow along, you are welcome to follow along. Please do so in our test environment, though. Um, we will put that uh, link in the chat so that you are able to get there. Uh, your username and password should be the same as what it is inside of UASIS, assuming you haven't changed your password in the last two weeks. Uh, if you have, it will be whatever your old password was. If you're running into issues, uh, you can message in the chat and we can get go ahead and get you help. Um, throughout this training, we are not going to take any questions throughout it. As I said, we do have a lot of information um, and a lot of pieces to get through today. Um, if you do have questions, you are welcome to put them into the chat. We will get them answered either during, uh, we have the, our entire state team here today. Um, so either one of them will answer the question or we will answer to, towards the end. Um, I do have a few minutes scheduled towards the end that we will take questions and things like that. Um, so uh, I think with that, I think we are good. Um, does anybody have any quick questions right now before we get started? Otherwise, we will jump in. Okay. Uh, the last thing I would just ask is just please make sure that you stay muted through the whole time. We do get feedback and I know that a lot of you guys are still in schools and so between bells and kids and students, um, I know that it can get loud. So just please make sure that you do keep uh, yourselves muted throughout this whole time. That way everybody can hear this as well as the recording doesn't pick anything up and that we were able to get a clean recording. Okay, let's go ahead and get started today. As I mentioned, everything that we will be showing you is up in production today. If you would like to follow along, you are welcome to using our test account. You will see that up at the top of the URL. Alex has also put that in our chat. We'll put it in again for those that just joined us. Uh, a couple of things about this login page. Um, you will see that uh, you have a username and password. This password, as you do type different things, uh, will you can turn that on and off. Uh, using this little eye icon. Um, the biggest thing we have found over the last few years is with different passwords is programs or users just enter their password incorrectly. Maybe they forget a capitalization, maybe they forget a punctuation, whatever it happens to be. That's usually the number one thing that we end up finding is that the, that the passwords are entered incorrectly. So if you're unable to log in, please use this little eye functionality. It is just a toggle switch. So if you click it, it changes uh, back from dots to, to uh, language we can actually read. Um, also, if you are a, if you've ever forgotten your password, um, you should have this forgot password functionality in here. Um, if you click on that, you'll be asked to you enter your username. Uh, once you enter your username, the system will find what your email address is, send you an email, and it will guide you through the process of resetting your password. Um, we have been got, we have gotten a few reports that this is working for some, not working for others. We are trying to still dig into why it's not working for some people and why it is for others. Um, we are hopeful that in the next few weeks we'll be able to figure it out and have it. Um, again, if you forgot your password, please utilize this before you message either your program admins or us. Um, try to get it to work. If it doesn't work, at least let us know that it's still not working for you and your program. Uh, but let's go ahead and log in. So if you go ahead and enter your username and your password, uh, you'll see that the blue login does end up turning blue once you do get that and you'll be taken to this screen. This is where you can select your program. Now for those program or for those users that have more than one program, this page becomes very vital. You need to select which program you are going to use. Uh, for those users that only have one program, uh, you will click the drop down and you'll see only one option. 
Uh, for me, I'm going to go ahead and select our test program. And once I select our test program, we are then taken to our dashboard. Um, that's the process of logging in. Um, it's fairly simple, fairly easy. We are going to speed a few of those things up over the next few months. Um, hopefully those that are in single programs, you won't have to choose your program and it'll just take you here into the, uh, the login. So that is an upcoming change that we would like to see uh, in the future. It's not there yet, um, and, but we'll let everybody know when it actually happens. This is the dashboard of UASIS. Uh, this is going to uh, change and progress throughout the life of UASIS. Right now, it's just a landing page. It just has kind of our symbol that you'll see throughout the system and just says, welcome to UASIS. Um, in the upcoming future, we do plan on adding more feet things on here. Uh, a couple of the features that we plan on having come up are um, notices of upcoming meetings, for example. Um, we will have a list of all meetings that we are able to put inside and it will have a potentially a scroll bar up at the top saying, hey, you know, you have an upcoming third Thursday this week. Um, we'll give links, we'll give every kind of all the information, especially for webinars inside of the system. But that way you are aware of upcoming meetings that are inside of here. We're also going to be putting uh, probably some static reports up here. So how are we doing? What are what, you know, What's our programs doing? What's the state doing versus how your program is doing? So this dashboard is very uh, is, is going to change. And even when we change it the once, it's going to potentially change two or three more times. Um, OK, anyway, back uh, to the dashboard. So as we do change things, these will be changed. Um, on the dashboard. Uh, a couple things on this dashboard. If again, you are associated to more than one program, uh, you will have this drop down. Um, on the side up here that you are able to select a different program. Um, if you're only associated to one single program, then you will only you'll you'll never probably use that functionality. Uh, up in this upper corner, you will see your name. If you click the drop down, you'll see two options right now. Uh, one of them is to change your password. So if you click change password, it will take you to where a spots where you can change your password. Um, as you type different passwords, you will see these password hints or password requirements will start to turn green as you do enter your password. Um, so that is something you will be able to do. Um, again, we do have the eyes programmed into here. So if you wanted to simply copy and paste that as that is the last uh, process in order to change your password, you can do so. Also making sure that you know you pa the password that you've typed in there. Uh, once you have your password set in there, you'll see the change password turns blue and you hit change password and your password will be changed. Um, if you hit cancel, you'll be taken back to the main page. Uh, with passwords, I will let you know, uh, passwords right now will expire every 90 days. That is a USB-E rule. Uh, we do hope that over the next year, we are able to get two-factor authentication built inside of UASIS. Once we have two-factor authentication built, uh, we will never need to expire passwords inside of the system. Uh, so keep that in mind right now. The passwords will expire every 90 days. If you do type your password in and you have an expired password, it will take you to the change, law, uh, change password screen and require you to change it then before you can continue to do anything. Uh, so that is, that's kind of the rules right now with passwords. Once we do get two factor up, we will uh, um, let everybody know that whatever their password is won't need to be changed. And we'll talk about how uh, the two factor authentication works. Uh, the last thing up in this upper corner is just to log out. Um, so you can manually log yourself out here. The system also has a 20 minute timeout functionality. Uh, as of right now, no, you are not able to see the numbers themselves as the numbers count down. It is all back end. Um, that's something I'm hoping to change here in the next couple of months to at least allow you to see. Um, it may not show you ever the full numbers. Um, there might just be a pop up that shows up and says, hey, you're you know, within one minute of logging out. Do you want to continue or are we OK to log you out? Um, so that is something that we are going to look at doing. So it is every 20 minutes just to it's a security precaution that we have built inside of the system. Um, the last thing on this is this oh, the menu over here on this far side. Uh, this is how we jump around inside of UASIS. So you see that we have the dashboard up at the top, followed by all of the different modules inside. Um, you will see we are, I currently have a state one. You guys will not see the state option down at the bottom. This is what stuff uh, built specifically for us um, at the state level.
We will go through each of these modules today and show you exactly what's inside of them. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into our first module, which is staff. When we click on staff, it will bring you up a list that looks like this. This is a list of all current staff that is inside of the system or inside of your program. Uh, you have a couple of things on here that I want you to be aware of. Up at the top here, uh, we do have a search staff uh, uh, input box. As you do type different things, for example, uh, you will see that it is a live search. So any, any functionality or any uh, users, I mean, that fit this protocol uh, or fit this search will be there. Um, it works on uh, first name, last name. It works on uh, username and um, email address. Uh, so you could do a different search in there. Down at the very bottom, you will see the this color bar, uh, for example. Um, you'll see we have four different colors, and you'll see that every uh, or every uh, tab of the user has a color associated on the left-hand side. Um, it's just kind of giving you a rule of thumb of exactly what's going on with any of these users. Uh, so, for example, if they were orange, they didn't have, they won't have permission to log in. If they're red, they've locked themselves out. Um, we are, we have yet to hit that 90 day marker, but once we hit 90 days, there may be some users who have expired passwords and that will let you guys know as a user, um, whether or not you do have, uh, um, users that have expired passwords that will need to reset it. Um, also on here, you'll see a couple of things. You'll see this little mouse icon. If you hover over the mouse icon, that lets you know who the last you or when the user last logged in. Um, this but this functionality for the permissions we'll talk about in a minute. Um, let's go ahead and uh, search for a couple of users. So if I'm adding a brand new staff into my program, I am going to want to click on this magnifying glass up in the corner. Uh, this will ask me for two things, a first name and a last name, and I can do as little or as much as I want for the last name. Uh, these kind of searches inside of here that search the whole database uh, uses what is called a soundex type of search, meaning that you don't have to spell the name exactly correct in order to get the results. Uh, it can get close. You can miss a letter. Maybe uh, they spelled their name differently. Um, however it is, the system will try to find as close of the matches as I can. But for example, if I want to search for, I'm going to search for uh, a user called Josh Ellerman. If when I hit search, I will see that I have one result that pops up. Now, as a user who's trying to enter a brand new staff, I'm going to click on this staff member and just verify that this information is in here. So if I knew that he last worked at the Salt Lake Schools, I would assume that I'm going to see his Salt Lake Schools address. Uh, phone number is going to change depending on whether it's a potential home or work phone number, but I'm going to want to just kind of go through this just to verify and see if this user is the user that I want before I try to add it. If this is the user that I want to do, then I will go ahead and enter a date of hire. Um, now, I can backdate any of these dates back to July 1st. Um, you can only backdate most dates inside of the system back to the beginning of the program year. Um, I'm going to also want to make sure I enter a pay of status, whether he is a full-time, part-time, or a, a volunteer. Um, and I want to verify that how many years inside of adult education has he worked. So if he's worked in a one program before, he might be still within that less than one years or one to three years. Uh, personnel, func uh, personnel function is what he was hired to do inside of the system. So we're going to say that this staff member was hired to be a local tutor and he was hired to be a teacher. Uh, does the staff member have any certification information? If he does, I will go ahead and mark that. Um, in this case, I'm going to say he doesn't have any certifications. He uh, does not does not have any one of these certifications, I should say. Uh, the last thing is I, if I want to set a password for him, um, I'll want to just set a basic password for the staff member. Uh, so that way, when they first log into my system or into it, that I can give them their username and password. Uh, their username is here. Those are automatically generated. There's not there. You will not be creating any sort of login. Um, login name for them. Uh, once I see all the information is incorrect, you'll see I have my update button will turn blue. Uh, once I click update, I now will go back to my list of staff. And I need to get that to where it resets. 
you will now see that I have Josh Ellerman inside of my program. Um, so that's how we are. We would add a, um, existing staff uh, inside of the system. Now, if I went through this whole search and found that, hey, this is not the staff member that I want, um, I will be adding a brand new staff member. So I, up here in the upper corner, I'm going to click add new user. And then anything with an asterisk inside of the system is required. Um, so if they have a cactus ID, I'll want to add that. Um, so for uh, the last, for the first name, I'm going to add the staff, student staff's first name. I'm going to add their last name. I'm going to add what their phone number is, and then I'm going to identify what type of phone. Is this their work phone? Is this their cell phone, home phone? What kind of phone number is this for the staff member? So I'm going to say that this is their work phone, and then I'm going to want to add an email address. So I'm going to enter this the staff's email address, um, and then I should be good to get. This will allow us um, as a, uh, users or as state users to be able to pull and create uh, listservs uh, so that we can send out email addresses. This is also the email address that you will use um, or that will be sent uh, for forgotten passwords or different things like that. Once we get a few more uh, pieces of uh, communication inside of the system, that this email address was, will also be used for that. If the staff member has any secondary phone or email, I can add that information here. Uh, I'll want to identify when the staff member was hired, so I can push this back again, back to the beginning of the program year, or if I hired them last week, I can just verify that that's their date. Um, I can enter whether they're paid full-time, part-time, or a volunteer, and how many years of adult education are they in. Um, again, these pay, these pay statuses and years in adult education are required by NRS. We do report those up for all of our staff members, so that is why we collect them and we want to make sure that they're updated on a yearly basis. Uh, personnel function is also NRS required. Why are we hiring this uh, staff member? What are they being hired to do? Again, it's checkmarked, so please you can enter more than one if they were hired to do more than one function. Uh, and then the last thing is, is uh, education and certificate information. Uh, so if this, if this staff member has a K-12 uh, certification, I'll want to bring uh, click that button. And then I'm required to enter when their expiration date is. So I'm going to say that the staff member's expiration is 6.30 of 2029. Uh, anytime you click any one of these and an expiration date field pops up, it is a required field. You will not be able to save until you enter that. Uh, the only ones, there's two that are, do not show any expiration dates, and of course that's not certified, and that's TESOL certifications. If you click a TESOL certifications, those do not expire, so we are not asking for an expiration date. Uh, the last thing is that I want to do is I want to go ahead and enter a password in for the user. Uh, again, I have a little I right here so that I can uh, verify what my password is. These passwords do not need to follow the same rules as what will happen is the first time this user successfully logs in, they will be required to change their password. Uh, so that's why these don't need to follow the rules of beginning a lowercase and everything else. We just require that the password be at least eight characters long. Uh, once I have all the pieces of information filled in here, I will have my save button down here will turn blue. Uh, you will notice this on a lot of our screens that you will not be able to save or update until all pieces of required uh, information on the screen are filled out correctly. Um, so if you if the save or the update is not turning blue, please double check all of the fields and make sure that they are uh filled in correctly with proper information inside of all of them. Um, we do checks on that as well. So once I have all my users inside of here, I'm going to go ahead and hit save. Uh, this will go through. We will say that you will see the success up in the corner that the user has now been successfully added. If I now went ahead and searched for the staff member uh, here, you will see that we have a username that was automatically generated and we have our email address and we have which program that they're entered in. Um, we'll see the mouse is not yet on here as the staff member is not logged in. So if you see my, the mouse icon on some and not on others, that just means the users have or have not logged in. All right, once we have a staff member created, we want to give them permissions to do different things inside of the system. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on this edit permissions icon and every user does have it. Once I click on that, I will get my permissions page. 
Um, we will see who I'm assigning it to and which program I'm assigning it to up at the top. And then I can go through and identify which permissions that I want this user to do. Um, all of these permissions are, are tied to specific pages. Uh, so we've changed the way the permissions are from the way UA, Utopia used to be. Utopia used to have roles that were kind of defaulted permissions. So if you were a teacher, you were going to get all the same permissions. Uh, we are now in there. Um, and you will want our every pay every user can now have a unique set of permissions based on what you want them to do. So if you don't want them to do anything within the classes, then we're not going to add anything in the classes. If I want this user to be able to uh, add class hours, I'm going to go ahead and select that they I want them to add class hours. Uh, reports are the same way. Every report is unique and that they have their own permission. So if I don't want them to have every you know federal table inside of there, I only want them to be able to run table four for example, I'll be able to select that. Um, all, as we build new uh, reports inside of the system, new permissions will need to be given. Um, that will include to you yourselves if you are the program admins or directors. So we will be able to or you will want to give those. So if I say, for example, we have a new report that is now available for everybody, I can't I don't have a way to automatically give it to everybody um, uh, that that already has all reports because that may be something that you may or may not want to give. So again, as we build new reports and if and again, uh, other additional permissions, those will have to be given after we do create those and push them inside of the system. Um, there is a staffing section as well, so I can either give or take away staff permissions and then all of the student things. We'll go through each one of these as we go through today. Uh, the last thing I want to show is if you have a user that you do want to give every permission to, there's a select all button up at the top. If you select that, it selects every permission that is on this page. Um, you can select that and then, of course, deselect certain ones that you want. So if I didn't want them to add, uh, add, add my classes, for example, I can remove those options. Once I have all my permissions based in there set, I'm going to go ahead and hit save. It'll give me just a confirmation, making sure I want to actually do this. I'll hit confirm. And then up at the top, we'll see that my staff permissions have been updated. If I were to go back into my user, I'll see, of course, that my staff member has. But now I can give this staff member both her username and her password. She'll be able to log in, reset her password, and she'll be able to do everything that we want um, or that we, that we ask her to do inside of the system. Okay. Once we have all of our users inside of the system or our brand new users inside of the system, we're going to want to build classes. Now, building classes is a, is a few step process. There's a few things that we end up needing to do. Um, most of this is not having to be done every time we build new classes, but we do. This is this is something that we want to check on a yearly basis. The first thing you'll want to do is go to locations and you'll want to verify that these locations are still active. So on this page, you'll see that we again, we have the these little uh, red green bars off on the side. And you will see which ones are active and not anything that is green means that it's an active location that we're still teaching locations at. Uh, you'll see, for example, I have this Adam site, for example, which is red. It's no longer a, a location we're teaching at. However, if I was coming into the into a new program or I came into it and we talked and said, hey, I want to build a new location uh, at this same site. Um, I can go ahead and click on click on that site. I can click the is active checkbox down at the bottom. I'll hit update and we'll now see that Adam site is now a brand new site that I actually want to uh, that I, I will be teaching classes at. Um, if, for example, uh, Cook's House is one that I no longer want to teach at or we're no longer able to teach at. Um, I will click that, click the is active check mark, hit update, and we will now see Cook's House has been now moved to an inactive site. Um, as we go through this, the reason why we show both active and inactive locations is as I've gone through the data imports, um, I have noticed that there is a lot of duplicated sites um, or locations. Uh, that's, I mean, it, it is kind of is what it is for what it is for right now. Um, however, I would like to see as we do move forward that if you guys do bring new locations on, um, whether that's inside of a local library, a new um, excuse me, a new uh, 
a classroom or, or a new school, whatever it happens to be. Maybe it's a new pr a jail that you're getting inside of. Whatever the situation is, please double check and go through and make sure that the site has not already been there. Uh, again, we do have a search up at the top. So if I were to start searching, for example, I want Golden Gate Park. Um, I can start searching and see that, oh, there is, a, there is a location that has already been built. I can now just reactivate this. However, we do know that there are times in which this is a brand new location. You're, you, we've never had that before, in which I'll click this add location in the upper right hand corner. And then it's going to ask me for my required pieces of information. So my required pieces of information are what is the name of the site so or location. So I'm going to say that this is Katrina's location. It's asking for an address. Now this could be the um, if you depending on how you're building your locations, this is whatever address of the school, of the prison, of the library, whatever it happens to be. Um, sorry, I'm trying to talk and type at the same time and it's not working out very well. But so we have the address, we have the city, we have the state, and we have the zip code. Um, you'll notice that phone number and, and we do have facts still in here, but they are not required pieces of information. However, if you do have a phone number for this location, please add it as we will create uh, a program directories based on this information of your locations that are active. Um, and yes, there are still some programs that use faxes to send verifications. And so if you do have a fax number you'd like to put in there, you can. Uh, our is active check mark down at the very bottom is uh, always there. As for new locations, it's always going to be checked. These other three, the is incarcerated, the community correctional and is other institutional are flags for the location itself. So if you are building a jail location, for example, you would want to make sure you click the is incarcerated flag. The reason this is important is it helps us identify which students are being identified or which are students are being put into this, uh, these classes in this location. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we do get into the students individually. Um, if it's a community correctional, which are like halfway houses, or I believe uh, like late or uh, um, our Davis program has, I think it's called the Red Barn. Those would be community correctionals um, and other institutions would be similar, would be like, we only have one in the state of Utah, which is our, um, uh, if Provo has it, it's our uh, state hospital. Um, if you believe that you should have, that one of your locations would fall under one of these, but you're not sure, please message us. Um, we are happy to have that discussion and whatnot. Um, Danielle and Stephanie are best suited for to answer that question. I can show you how to mark it. They will answer better questions on whether that should be marked appropriately or not. Once I have all of my uh, required pieces in here, I'm going to go ahead and hit save down at the bottom. And when I now hit save, I will now see that I have a new Katrina location here that I will be able to use as I build classes. Okay, as we do go ahead and build classes, there is a new functionality, or before we build classes, I should say, there's a new functionality inside of the system that programs may or may not use. This is completely optional. It's up to you whether you want to or not use um, this, but I do want to show you how it can be used. That way you can decide whether you want to use it. Uh, some of our programs that have larger um, or that teach multiple terms throughout the year, this will be able to allow you to build what are what we call a master schedule. Um, we call it terms and periods inside of it, but what you're doing is you're essentially using your master schedule you have throughout the year and you're building it. Um, as we populate different things, you'll see things will be populated in here. Um, so once you click on terms and periods, you've got two questions, what school year? And right now the only option is this school year. Um, and I do have one term that is already built inside of here and I can select that, but I'm going to want to potentially build a new term. Terms inside of the system are what dates your terms are being taught at. So say, for example, you have eight terms throughout the year. Uh, one of them is taught, uh, so let's say August 15th through September 30th. That is one of your terms that you would want to build. Um, and if we want to build a brand new term, not use one that's already inside of the system, I'm going to click this little calendar icon over on the side. Uh, I'm going to select which school year I want, and we'll see that I already have one term, but I'm going to add a new term. 
Uh, it asks for three questions. So what is the name of the term? So I'm just going to call this to keep with um, uh, my pattern of Katrina. So I'm going to say this is Katrina's term, for example. Uh, my begin date I said was August 15th, 2024. And my end date is going to be 9-30, 2024. Um, once I have all of those in here, down at the bottom, I'll see my save terms blue. I'll go ahead and click save, and now I'll see that I have a Katrina term with the date. Um, we will start seeing these icons throughout the whole system. Um, so this little star exclamation, if you hover over it, that shows you who created that record. Um, we do this throughout the whole system. I will point them out as I do see them, um, but we are trying to give as much uh, clarity or... Um, throughout the whole system of who did what and when. So the little star um, exclamation is who created, the little person is who last modified it. Now you will see at the very beginning, I do see cre I do stay, stay, stay created and modified. Um, and so that does kind of help you on there, but you will see those throughout the system and that's what those are for. Um, if I needed to edit or delete my one of my terms, so maybe I said, oh, I need to backdate this uh, or, or I, we're not going to teach this until, say, the 19th because that's a Monday, I can click the little edit icon, hit update, I'll confirm it, and we will now see that I am now here that my term is now updated. Um, if I built a term and I decided down the road, oh, this is not a, something that I need, I can delete the term. Um, deleting a term here will not have any effects on any classes that you already have associated to that term. Um, terms and periods are a one-way street. I'll kind of show you what I mean by that down the road, but that's um, uh, something that to keep in mind is that they're not tied together. Once I have my term built, I'm going to go ahead and hit back. And if I click on that and click on my term, which I did realize I still need to update that. Alex, can you please put that on my list? Um, I will notice that I don't have anything. There's nothing else that populates, nothing else that shows. What does happen when I do select my term, my, my specific term, is I do have my little... Um, clock over here that turns pink and if i hover over it it says add periods so once i have my term identified with what my dates are going to be i can then add my periods so again this is still building your master schedule i'm not associating anything right now to the specific um uh to 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 any sort of classes i'm just building uh my my uh containers so to say so period. Um, we'll see up at the top here. It'll let me identify which term I'm actually doing. So I make sure that I'm in the right one. And then I'm going to go ahead and click on add period. So right now I'm going to have this. I'm going to just call this my Katrina period one. Uh, I will mark what day it's being taught on. So this is going to be taught on Monday. Uh, this class is going to be taught from, oops, not, yep, we're going to go, we're going to go four in the afternoon to six in the afternoon. Once I have that in here, a couple of things shall happen. So once I have all my required pieces, you'll see that my save icon now turns blue. However, before you hit save, periods don't usually only last one day. Maybe this class is taught during the term three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So I have this clone icon that I can click. And if I click on clone, I will create a new clone. Couple things that will happen um, as I do this. One, these periods will be associated underneath the same one, so they're all gonna be associated together. But the second thing that happens is that my day also automatically increments. In increments. So you'll see I was Monday here, it automatically increments it to Tuesday. Well, if Tuesday is not the day I want, I can go ahead and change that to Wednesday, and it's still taught the same time. And if I've said that this class is also taught on a Friday, I'm going to clone it one more time. You'll see my day automatically incremented. I'm going to say I'm going to select this to Friday. Now, what I can do is if, for example, on Fridays, maybe this class is taught from 2 to 3 o'clock, for example. So it's taught a little earlier. You know, maybe sometimes the schedules get shifted around, whatever it happens to be. But I can shift that time period. So not your begin and end times do not have to be the same every day. But what this is building is this is building a period one container for this Katrina term that I have built inside of the system. Once I have all of my periods built, 
uh, for this block. I'm going to go ahead and hit save. Once I hit save, you'll see that my I now have a calendar that shows up that kind of gives me what my overview looks like. So, for example, uh, I can see my Katrina period is taught from four to six on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Friday, and Fridays from two to three. If I need to add another period, I can go ahead and select add period. I can add my period and I can do the same information and it will add that data into here. There are two ways to view all of your periods for the term. So once you select on your school year and your program term, for example, so if I went to program 42 to see what was built there, I can see that I have a period 42 that's built from 10 to uh, 10, 10 to 11 every day, except Wednesday and Friday is it's a half hour. Um, so I have the calendar view that I can select or if I scroll down to the very bottom, I'll see I have this little table view that I can identify. And it just gives me a more of a table view rather than a calendar view. Um, what this does and how this works is this really does will, will help with those programs that do say have that teach six, seven, eight little mini terms throughout the year. Um, sometimes with those mini terms, you're going to be teaching four, five, six different periods. Now, again, remember, these are just uh, containers that I am building for this information. I'm not saying that this is a class called Katrina period one. This is simply a container. Now when I build my classes, I can then identify that this class is taught during this container period and that way it can automatically help. Again, I'll show you why this can be useful and how it can speed up your class building. But you, if you do want to build this, you're welcome to. Again, this is completely optional for you guys to build. You don't have to use it, but you can if you want to. Uh, okay, uh, let me build one more period so I, I can show you the two different periods. Um, two, Monday, we're going to start this at six. And we're going to go to seven. We're going to clone it onto Tuesday and Wednesday, and we're going to save that. So now you'll see I have a Katrina period one, which is taught these three days, and this is Katrina two, taught during these times. Again, remember, I'm just building containers for this. This is not identifying that this is a specific class. All right, let's go ahead and talk about classes. So let's go ahead and click on the class list page, and I'll tell you kind of how the terms and periods actually work. So as I do this, your class list page will show you your active classes. Um, it will show you any class that is still active um, inside of the system. Again, we'll notice that, that we have a green icon down on the side. We do automatically hide closed classes as the data inside of UASIS has been around since 2007. So for a lot of programs, that's a lot of classes. Um, it's a lot of data to pull. Um, if you wanted to read or see any of your closed classes, um, you can click the filter option over here. Um, if you had a specific name you were looking for, you can do that. Uh, maybe I wanted to see a specific instructor that was doing that, I can do there. Um, or I can select, I want to see all of my inactive classes, for example. Now, do remember that this might take a minute as it is having to load almost 20 years worth of data inside of here. But now I can see all of my classes that are inactive. I can see the dates on which they were taught, that kind of stuff. All right, so let's go ahead and just search for our actives. I can look, so I have a C3PO class and I have a credit class 42 in my estate online class. If one of these classes is similar to what I want, we can use what is called the clone feature. I will show you that in a minute, but we're going to build a class from scratch. Um, and, and show you kind of how these terms and periods work and all of the required pieces that are inside of it. So up in the upper corner here, I have an add new class. I'm going to click on that. And again, remember everything with an asterisk is a required piece. So my class right here, I'm going to just name it as my Katrina uh, class one. Um, this is the class that I'm teaching. Uh, I do have my active flag, and so if again, please, as you build new classes, don't check this. Um, but as you clone classes, this is going to be one field that you do want to verify. State online course uh, check mark for those 
programs that do teach the state online course in which Alex has helped build over the last couple of years, this is going to be a check mark that is crucial for you to make sure you mark. So if you have a class that you are willing to teach and enroll students throughout the state into this class, you're going to want to click this check mark. Uh, this will allow other programs to see the class. Um, if you are not teaching this, um, I will show you where you can see all of the state online courses that are active. Um, and we'll talk about those state online courses as we do get into those. But this check mark is vital for those that do teach those courses that other students from other programs can enroll. Uh, here you'll see my term and my period. Now, if I, when I click my uh, term drop down, I will see my two terms that I have. When I click on my Katrina term, a couple of things happen. So my term name automatically gets filled in. Uh, I have my begin date that gets automatically filled in and my end date. So again, I built a container that says, hey, this is what my begin and end dates are for this class or for these classes that I'm going to build. So I could be building one class. I could be building 40 classes. I know some programs teach a lot of classes during each individual term. So rather than going through and having to enter a begin and end date for each time, they can just select the term. Now, once I've selected my term, the period drop down, you'll see I have two periods because those are the two periods associated to this term. If I click period one, for example, you'll notice nothing up here on the top changes. However, if I scroll down, and I've yet to figure out why this check mark is not working, these will all be checked along with the dates and times that this is um, happening. Um, now, this should be automatically filled. Uh, filled. Um, it looks like I may have a small bug inside of this system, and I will verify exactly what's going on here um, inside of there. Um, but this will automatically be filled in for your period or for your dates and periods. Um, so again, it helps you build your meeting dates and times on a faster basis. Um, it also helps you build your begin and end dates. Now, I did mention that these terms and periods are completely optional. If you didn't want or didn't build any terms and periods, that's okay. You just manually enter your begin date and your end date for all of your classes and you're good to go. So it's not something, again, you have to build. So if some of our smaller programs, they may never touch these terms and periods. For our larger programs that do utilize this, this may be something that you want to use on a regular basis. Okay, once we have our begin and end date, and again, you'll notice both of those are asterisks inside of their system. It's going to ask us the location. So where are we teaching this? Um, again, if I have prison or uh, maybe a jail location or different locations throughout my site, I will be able to select which one. You know, some programs like to build an ESL site, even though that it is still within the same building. many of those yet, um, but we are going to get a lot of the reports to where you can run a report based on the location rather than the whole program itself. Um, so I'm going to put this uh, into our Katrina location. Uh, you'll see I have four check marks here. Now, none, of, most of the rest of this is not a required field, but I'm going to go over what each one of these, uh, I what each one of these fields actually does. Uh, so the is IET, IELCE, family literacy, and workplace literacy are all flags that you can mark what that the class is. Um, so if this class was an IET class, meaning that every student you're going to enroll inside of this class is uh, an IET student, you would want to go ahead and click on that check mark. What this will do is this will help us identify any students that you missed marking as IET. We will do, we kind of do a double check at the very end or when you enroll the student that this student is an IET student. Um, the same thing is with the IELCE family literacy and workplace literacy. Uh, these last three are um, you, you, you would receive federal funds for those. So if you don't know what they are, um, there's a good chance your program doesn't have those. Um, if you do receive funds for these three, please verify and see if you have a class that is built for these. Again, we want to make sure that we're identifying students as these different flags 
because we do report all of these flags up to NRS on a yearly basis. And we feel that over the last few years, we just haven't captured all the students that should be captured. And this was kind of our last ditch effort to kind of capture any students is to mark the class and the class will help us mark the students. Uh, total class size and uh, online seats and physical seats. These are our optional fields. So if there is no limit, meaning that you can have an unlimited amount of students inside of there, um, then you're going to want to leave these blank. If, for example, though, I am a teacher and I say that my max class size is 25 students, meaning that I only want a class size of 25, I can go ahead and do that. Uh, entering a class size will allow you to uh, put students into a um, either uh, um, a first come first serve holding, um, so a wait list option, or you can just simply lock out students uh, or lock out staff members from entering students into this class. Um, so that's the total class size. These online seats and physical seats kind of work in conjunction with the class size. So online seats is how many online seats students have. Now, again, this is them taking the class uh, as, as a live class, meaning that like we are right now with teams, this would be you guys would all take up an online seat. Uh, for um, those that are coming to class, to a, a brick and mortar building, those would be your physical seats. So again, you can, if, if the staff member is only comfortable with say having 10 students uh, online, then they can have 10 students and maybe they end up having 20 physical seats that they can achieve or that they have in the classroom. Now, one thing you'll notice is that this is that my if I total up my physical and my online seats, it ends up being entering 30. Uh, that is more than what my class total size is. The way that'll work is once you reach the class size total, it doesn't matter that my other my physical or my online seats have not been filled it will lock you out. Um, if, for example, I have all 10 of my online seats that have been filled, that will only leave me 15 uh, physical seats that I'll be able to use. So I will still have five physical seats, but as a teacher, I'm only comfortable having 25 in, in the class size um, for whatever that is. So again, that's completely optional if you want to use. If you do not want to use this and you don't have any sort of class size, you can leave those blank and there will be an unlimited amount of both online seats and physical seats inside of that classroom. Uh, the one caveat I would just bear or just uh, uh, make sure you don't do is if you enter a zero, for example, what that will do is it'll take the functionality of online seats away, meaning that there is no option to have, you know, through a Zoom call or through a Teams call. So if that is not an option, then you're going to want to put zero. Otherwise, I could go ahead and leave that blank. Uh, for this example today, I'm going to go ahead and leave it as 10. The last option for these class sizes is how do I want to use, what do I want to do when, once I reach my max? Um, I have two options. I can either use a waiting list, meaning that as soon as I have 25, students will get put onto a waiting list. And then when there's a spot that opens up, I can then use this waiting list to enroll a student inside of there. Or I can use what's called a hard lock, meaning that there's no waiting list. As soon as I hit 25, students are just kind of out of luck and they'll have to try to hit uh, catch this class at another term. Um, so there are two options that you have that is completely up to you and your program. Um, talk about it amongst yourselves and just figure out what works best for you and your program. Okay, these next three is only ELL, only GED, and graduation area are all tied together. If the class is only an ELL class, so it's only taught, it's only ESL students are in there, they're not going to be, you know, earning credit or anything. You are going to want to click the check mark for is only ELL. Um, that you will see disables my graduation area. I cannot click on my graduation area, for example. Um, this would the this class this check mark and the is only GED check mark, which does the same thing to the graduation area, are two check marks that we're going to use as for reporting purposes state wise. We want to see how many classes are ELL only or are GED only. Um, 
if you're teaching a class that, is, that students can both work on GED and earn credit inside, maybe it's a lab type of class, you are not going to want to check this class this because you are then disabled on the graduation area. So again, these two check marks are only if the whole class itself is ELL or if the class is GED only. If you can teach for credit in the class and students can earn credit, leave those two blank and you're going to want to select a graduation area. The multi-course up at the top allows you to select any course or any uh, graduation area that you want, language arts, math, science, etc. If this is, say, a language arts course, for example, I would select language arts and then for this class, the only options I would have to give uh, would be language arts and elective. So um, that's probably been the biggest thing over the last couple of weeks that I have noticed on why programs are why users are not able to award credit is that this graduation area is being left blank. Um, so please double check that before you send us a message if you're not able to award a credit to a student uh, for a specific class is there's a good chance that you may have left the graduation area blank. Uh, we have a primary teacher field. This is a required field. Who is teaching the class? Unlike in the past, we want to know who is actually teaching the class, not who is certified to teach the class. So even if this is a, uh, a course that can be taught for graduation, I am still going to want to see who is actually teaching this class. So I'm going to scroll down. I'm going to find Katrina as my teacher, and she's going to be the one teaching the class. Again, she may not have a license that can teach, but all credits are still going to be uh, pass or, um, signed off by someone who does have a certification on that. But we want to know who's actually in the classrooms, not who's just who's certified. You do have this teacher two and teacher three you can put in. So if uh, she's not certified, but say, for example, Kelly is, I can put those in there. Again, it's more informational than it is. It's, it's, it's only informational to teach who's teacher two and teacher three. But again, you do have the options of adding more than one teacher if you want. Uh, these next few sections I'll deal with the student's online portal. Uh, we don't have it yet up yet. Um, we are hoping that uh, within the honestly within the program year that we'll be able to get the student portal online. Um, we'll go over these at at that time, but the description, uh, these two check marks, the LMS and platform, are all going to be used for the student online portal, and we'll talk about those later. Uh, building assignment, room assignment is going to be used on our print uh, student schedule report that we're going to end up creating soon. Uh, what we're going to do is if you had a specific building or a specific room, so if I wanted them to know that it is room 125, for example, I can put that. Then when we print off a student schedule, um, it will show which room that they are in. That way the students can see which rooms all of their classes are assigned to them. If the class has any sort of fee, you can add that there. Meeting dates and times. Um, this is uh, something that we're wanting to make sure gets changed as we move into UASIS. These meeting days and times are what times a student can physically come in and do uh, classwork with a teacher. Uh, now, maybe that is open to close for your program. In this case, this is a class that is taught from four to six, uh, two days a week, and from two to three on the third. I want to make sure that these meeting days and times are what the student has available to them. Past, I have seen that you have Sunday through Saturday, you're from midnight to midnight, meaning that it's all day. Um, I don't think any program is open on Sundays um, here in the state of Utah, uh, maybe some Saturdays. So I wouldn't expect to see many Sundays and Saturday schedules inside of there. And definitely if I see a Monday through Friday type of course, I would not expect to see really anything before probably 7 or 8 a.m. Um, if you do have uh, classes that are currently set like that, please go through and change them. Um, we do run reports um, to say how many hours are available for our students, um, and we do use this. And so if those are not reported correctly, we do get incorrect data, and it makes it really hard to say, oh, 
you know, on average, our students are, or programs are available X amount of day or X amount of time for each day. So please double check all of your days and times. I've had to help a couple of programs over the last couple of weeks just set that correctly. So again, that needs to be what time students are available to either come in or if this is an online course, when you are available to be, uh, have the, your live hours. So something in which they can interact with you um, immediately. Once I have all my meeting days and times set correctly, my save down at the very bottom will be will turn blue. I'm going to go ahead and hit save. We'll see up at the top that my Katrina one class is saved. I'll see that I have it saved here. Um, on inside of here, a couple things you'll see. Um, so I have my this is my link. So this is how I can get back in and edit anything if I need to edit any of those pieces. Um, this is my schedule. So each one of those is a schedule of what when time the classes are taught. Um, so that we know that the class schedule is important, but it doesn't always need to be visible. Most programs or users will come to this page to simply get to the class or to enter hours. They're not always needing to see the class schedule. Uh, this right here is uh, the little numbers shows you how many students are currently enrolled in the class. So we see the brand new class, of course, has zero, but this state credit online has 10 students enrolled in it. Um, and that's just kind of giving us information. Yes, this link, this will will eventually be linked to our uh, class list uh, report that we currently have, but that link has not been made yet. In order to do that, you've got to go to reports and we'll show you that towards the end of the day. Um, and the last thing is these three little ellipses. If you click on it, you do have a couple of different options inside of there that you want. Um, we'll go through those as we get through each section. So hours, um, uh, bulk and roll, that kind of stuff. A couple of these are not yet currently programmed, like check-in, review hours, and the wait list. But those will be coming as soon as we get through all of our federal reporting period. Okay. All right, now that we have classes built, let's go ahead and move into students. So to find all my students, I'm gonna go ahead and click on student. And what will you'll see up at the very top, I'll, you'll see that this is my program's active students. So these are only students that are currently active inside of your program right now. Um, I do have a search functionality here. So if I needed, wanted to find a specific student, so I'm gonna search for Emily, for example, You'll see that as I start to type, these will be um, searchable. Um, first name, last name, uh, date of birth, utopia name, utopia number, and for those in our prisons and jails that deal with uh, offender numbers, you can also enter the offender number up at the top here, and it will filter out there. Um, as you look at these, you'll see that I have right here, for example, it says Ogden and Test. This shows you which programs the student is currently enrolled in. So if they're enrolled in more than one program, you can immediately see that here that they are enrolled in more than one program. Um, it's just quick information to kind of give you what you need. Um, you can click on the student's name and that will take you to the home page. Um, and we'll get into the, some of the student's home page in a little bit. Um, those that have gone into Utopia today and if you've tried to enter a brand new student may notice that there's a new there's a button that is now missing um, to enter a brand new student uh, into uh, the system you have to do one search um, over the last actually really since Utopia or, or since Oasis went online um, Alex and I have had probably between three to probably seven, eight, nine, ten 10 uh, duplicated students per day that we are having to fix. Um, so we have changed how the process works for adding brand new students. Um, to search, if you have a brand new student that you want to add, uh, the first thing you'll need to do is you'll need to go up here to the search all students and you'll click this. Um, you'll see that my add new student button is now here. However, it is hidden. Um, or I guess deactivated. If you try clicking on it, nothing will actually happen. What you need to do is you will need to do a search first. Um, we're wanting programs to do just a quick search. Again, this search is very similar to the staffing search in which you don't have to get the names exactly right in order to actually do that. Um, you will, 
uh, be able to get close. So what I would usually recommend is as you are searching for these staff members, go ahead and just put our students, I mean, go ahead and put in a partial name. So for example, I'm going to search for someone with the last name of Ellerman and he entered his first name as Douglas. So I'm going to go ahead and enter Doug as the first name. Now when I hit search, I will potentially get results. Um, we did change these results, so they are now in alphabetical order uh, by last name. So you can go through and find all of my searches. Um, if I'm going through here, maybe I find my student, maybe I don't. What you will notice now, however, is that my add new student is now blue and it's now clickable. So we are wanting you guys to go through one, at least one search before you do end up going into um, uh, before you add brand new students. Um, for example, though, we'll get into uh, enrolling an existing student in a minute. Um, if I'm not able to find my student, I'm going to now click on add new student. And the process is the exact same as it always has been. Um, to add a new student, they will, of course, fill out your intake form. All required pieces of information are still with an asterisk, um, so you'll need to enter all of those. So we're going to go ahead and enter a brand new student. I'm going to enter in his name is going to be Trenton Little, for example. Uh, his birthday on when he, uh, what his birth date is. You will notice that once I enter a birth date in, uh, his age will automatically uh, populate in here. And that will show you how old he is as of today. Um, race, what race did he mark? You'll notice that Hispanic Latino is now included in all of these. Um, this goes back to NRS reporting. What did, um, and these are the groupings that they have for our race and ethnicity. Um, mark whichever one they did. If they mark more than one, there is an option for more than one race. You are welcome to uh, click. Um, gender, one thing you'll see, notice this year as we do go through, is that there's two new options for our students. Uh, we have a non-binary and we have a no answer. So students are able to um, answer any one of these. We do report them now as such. Um, again, if they would like to mark one of those, but again, they have to choose one of these four. Um, we've been asked a couple of times what happens if they don't choose one of these, either a race or a gender. And since they are required fields are for NRS, you will have to do your best guess as um, the staff member entering them to put what you believe that they are. Um, it's the only way that we can kind of enter all of the data inside of the system is to have you guys do your best guess on what they identify as. Uh, pronouns are in here. If they want to use pronouns, we're going to start you pushing the pronouns. So if they identify as one of these others, we're going to push it onto like class list page, um, onto the other pages. That way, if they want to, for example, use they, their, they, them, theirs, you'll be able to identify that as you run uh, reports or different things like that, um, just to help better feel, make the student feel um, included into our programs. Social security number, you'll notice, is not a required field. However, we are trying our best to get all social security numbers into the system as best as possible. This little I right here, you'll see are any SSN requirements. Um, these are all from the Social Security Office on what uh, validates a, 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 a good social security number. Um, and so here's some of the requirements inside of here. Uh, currently, we don't I don't have any of these being checked on the SSN. I have yet haven't gotten to that point yet, um, but they will eventually be checked and let you know whether that social is a good social based upon these requirements. Uh, for those that have offender IDs, this is where you'll enter your offender number. Um, other ID is a field used for your own programs. You can use that for whatever you want. Um, we don't care, um, and programs may change that when it moves between programs. Currently, we don't have this um, ID anywhere except a couple of reports, but if you feel that you want this other ID in other locations, let us know. We are happy to have conversations. Again, this is your guys' field. It's an alphanumeric field that you can use for whatever you feel. GED TS candidate ID is the TS, is the GED ID that we do have that we'll have inside of here. If you enter it and the student does take the GED um, and we end up getting the records, um, it will be a hundred percent match. You won't have to go through this potential uh, approval of yes, this is the, our student. Um, 
to get a quick caveat on GED, we do have, um, I, I have finished the GED process. We are getting it pushed all the way up and should be online within the next week. So for those that have been waiting for GEDs to data match, um, that process should start within the next week um, to get the, all of those uh, data matched. Um, yes, I am going all the way back to the beginning of the program year and actually into last program year as well and will import everything um, over the last year into our system so that we can data match them appropriately. Tribal affiliations, if they're associated with any sort of tribe, you're welcome to uh, put that on there. Um, address. One thing you will notice with the address is it is not a required field. Um, however, um, on our intake forms, you will notice that it is marked as a required field. Uh, the reason why it is not marked in the system as a required field, and it goes a lot back to our offenders, um, is if you leave this blank, then your program's address will be used as the student's address. So if they don't have an address and they leave a blank, we'll use yours. Um, if they do have one, please enter what that is. Um, in this case, if the student has or gives you the residency document as well, then we will go ahead and um, enter that into the system as uh, or, or mark that the student has the residency document. Fill out what the address is with the city state zip. Contact information is again optional. We want to know what kind or how we can get a hold of them. Um, so if there's a phone number, um, we want to be able to get that. We ask what type of phone this is. Is it a cell phone, work phone, home phone, depending on what it is. Um, just mark whatever uh, they mark in, inside of the system. If they've got a secondary phone, we'll go ahead and you can enter that. Primary email is not required. Um, however, if they do have one, uh, please enter it inside of there. Uh, we'll be using the uh, both phone or both email and phone number, hopefully phone number for communication purposes. Two students that you guys will be able to use from the system. Uh, we are going to start working on getting some communication tools built inside of there, but we will be using both email and phone number as different ways that you can send messages to students. Um, again, if they've got a secondary email, go ahead and do that. Um, primary phone opt in. Um, you'll notice on the intake form, it says that it, it's an opt out. And uh, what you'll need to do with well, the reason we have that kind of what looks to be backwards is if the student marks that they are opting themselves out of the system or out of communication, then we will want to make sure that you click the check mark inside of here. By default, we are going to opt every student in. If they opt themselves out, you have to click the check mark to opt them out as well. Um, so that was kind of the logic behind how that was built and why the why it seems um, backwards in the system. Uh, emergency name. If there's any sort of emergency uh, contact that the student gives, for example, um, they you can enter it inside of there. Um, if they have a phone number inside of the system, you can enter the phone number inside there. And the last thing is, who is this student or who is this emergency contact to the student? Are they a spouse, guardian, sibling? What are they? Um, we just want to know in case we do have to contact the student or in case you guys have to use this emergency contact is who is who are you contacting? Um, is, is this a sibling? Is this a brother? You do have an option down at the very bottom for an other. And if you do select other, you can type in who it is. Um, so for example, if you know Oliver is uh, Trenton's boss, for example, we can identify that. That way, when we do make the phone call of, hey, there is an emergency, you know who you're talking to. Um, so hopefully that does help as uh, that was feedback from the old system is I just don't know who I'm contacting when I have given emergent or when they give us an emergency uh, phone number. Education section, um, we want to find out what the kind of where the student was. Uh, highest grade completed is required. Again, you'll notice that we have kind of groupings of different grades. So are they 9 through 12, no diploma, or do they have a diploma, college, what are they? Um, we want to know, was their um, highest grade completed? Was it in or out of the U.S.? It's a toggle switch. If I toggle it on, you'll see it's outside of the U.S. Otherwise, if I leave it defaulted off, it then states that the student is a U.S. 
uh, was last attended school in the U.S. Uh, does the student have an IEP or a 504? We want to know whether the student had either one of those. SSID uh, is a seven-digit number that uh, all K-12, Utah K-12 public school students get. Um, you will find this number at the top of their transcripts. All transcripts should have an SSID up at the top. We do plan on linking into the SSID system so that you can look it up if you don't have the transcript or if the student doesn't know what it is. Um, so we are still working on the connections there, but we do plan on making that connection so that you can get the SSID. The SSID is very crucial for those students that are between the ages of 16 and 19. Um, so uh, we want to just verify, or we want to make sure uh, that those students have them as we do run an, or produce a report on a uh, uh, yearly basis called the Uzi report, the out of school youth report. Uh, then we will want to make sure that uh, we can uh, co collect the SSID as that will tell us who their last K-12 district and school is. Um, speaking of last K-12 K district and school, we want to know that. Again, we don't care necessarily if it was in or out of uh, the, the out of Utah. We just want to know where their last K-12 district school was. K-12 graduation cohort um, is a new field inside of the system. Um, it, it came about as we were wanting to make sure that we identify uh, which students um, are say seniors versus juniors. Um, it's really hard with an 18 year old to identify are they they already graduated or are they still needing to graduate with this current school year. One thing with this K-12 graduation cohort is if the student is below the age of 18, uh, so that would be 2007, yep. Uh, so if they're under the age of 18, this K-12 graduation cohort becomes a required field. Um, so you'll need to collect that information. The K-12 graduation cohort is on the um, intake form. So you'll want, so you'll be able to collect it there. Um, it doesn't have to be a future one, for example. So if this student, for example, of 2007, uh, 24 years old, uh, you could put whatever their graduation cohort is, for example. So I think that would be uh, 2018, for example. Um, that's okay. You'll be able to run different reports on there as we do collect more and more uh, graduation cohorts. Uh, signatures. Um, have they given us permission to data match? Yes or no. So if they set, signed it and said that we can data match them, um, if, again, if the student is under 18, uh, this parent to permission to data match will become, a, will become a field as well that you can select. And is the grievance policy signed or not? We'll call on to make sure we identify that. Everything that has an asterisk, again, is a required field. So we're going to want to make sure we hit save down at the bottom uh, or that the blue does turn save. What we'll see is we'll see that it's saved and now we are on our students homepage. So that is entering all of the students demographics inside of the system. OK, so once we have a student enrolled in the system, we are going to want to um, enroll them into our program. So. To enroll a student into our program, a couple of no flags that you will see. So up at the very top, you will see this, please enroll student into your program. Um, it's kind of this salmon colored uh, pill icon, but it lets you know that, hey, the student's not active in your program right now. And so if you are wanting to do different things with them, you can't. Um, these uh, little links down here at the bottom will turn active or, or depending on whether the student's enrolled in your program or has ever been enrolled in your program. Um, so for example, uh, print official transcript, you'll notice it's grayed or out right now. I can't click on it, I can't do anything. But if I had a past student who graduated with me come back to try to get an official transcript, I'd be able to print it because they've been with us in the past. So there are some of these that are, um, that you can pull um, even at, even if the student is not currently active, but we do limit exactly what you can do between an active and an inactive student. So to enroll a student into your program, I'm going to want to click this enroll in programs up at the very or up towards the top, and it's going to ask a question: What date did the student start in the program? So I'm going to click my drop down. I'm going to select the date. I can either hand type this or I can enter it. Again, you'll notice I can't go back further than July 1st. 
I'm going to say the student started in July 1st. This plan date of reentry, don't worry about that right now. Don't enter a date into there. Um, and that's supposed to be hidden, and we'll get. I, I'm working on getting that hidden. Um, but we're going to go ahead and hit save as as I've entered my date into there. And at that point, we have our student entered into a program. A couple of things that you'll notice is that one, I'm not selecting an NRS registration. I'm not selecting a contact type for the student. Those are all pieces that are in the old system, and so uh, those are gone away. At this point, the student is enrolled into your program. And you will go ahead and, uh, you know, uh, you can start working with them at that point. Also on this enrollment page are a couple other things. Uh, program types, IET, ILCE, Family Literacy, K-12, Workplace, and Out-of-State. These are those other program types that you can add to a student. A couple of these you should recognize from our class page, the IET, ILCE, Family Literacy, and Workplace Literacy. If you have a student that is enrolling in a class that is marked as an IET, please make sure you mark it here. Um, there is, as I mentioned, that kind of last ditch effort to kind of to make sure that a student is enrolled and counted correctly. So if you do enter a student um, into one of those, say, IET classes that you built, but you forgot to mark it here, the system will automatically mark the student as an IET student. Um, so if you come back to here, you look at the student's homepage that the student will be marked appropriately as IET. Again, only use those flags on that class page if the whole class itself is identified as one of those. If the class is not identified as one of those or not the whole class, then you won't be able to use those and you will need to do a double check to make sure that these counts are correct. Uh, this is also the page in which you separate a student from a program. We'll get into separations a little bit more at the, towards the end of the day, show you exactly what the, how that works. But since I have my student enrolled, I'm going to go ahead and hit back. A uh, couple things you'll notice. One, I now have all of my fields now open and available. None of them are disabled as the student is now current in my program. I can see that also down here saying my student is enrolled. That's my test name and that there's my dates for uh, when the student is there. Um, you'll notice also up towards the very top, we will, you'll notice that the status has changed, for example. Um, and so it now says, please update the student status and barriers for the current school year. So it no longer says to enroll, but we want to make sure that the student status and barriers are updated. So status and barriers are this third option down here. We're going to want to go ahead and click on the status and barriers, and we're going to want to fill out the information that the student gave us. Um, if the student's any sort of refugee, they'll mark that they're refugee information, and you can add that here up at the top. Their employment status, what are they? Are they employed, uh, employed but received termination, unemployed or not in the labor force? Uh, your difference between the unemployed and not in the labor force is your unemployed students are students who are actively searching for a job. You're not in the labor force is that they're not actively searching for a job. Those will usually be like our jail students, uh, sometimes stay at home moms. It kind of depends on the situation, but that's your difference between the two. So I'm gonna mark that the student is employed and then I'm going to go through my 13 questions that they've answered and ask for the barriers. Uh, so are they any one of these? Are they low income? Are they, you know, a homeless runaway youth? Whatever they happen to be. One of these that you'll notice is this ELL low level literacy and culture barriers is selected. Um, by NRS definitions, all students qualify as having this as a barrier to employment. Um, we're not sure why. We don't, decide, we don't agree with it, but NRS rules state that all students do that. So even if you uncheck that because the student didn't check that, in the back end when this page saves, this check mark gets rechecked. Um, so best just leave it um, alone. Don't worry about it. Um, it. Every student will be marked with that. Um, if there are any questions or uh, about what it, what identifies a student as, say, a migrant seasonal farm worker or a displaced homemaker, I can click on this little icon, I icon, and this will give me the definitions. These are federal definitions that we have pulled. Um, I do have all of these in a Word document that I can send you. Please just shoot me a message and let me know that you'd like to see these or have a copy of these, and I'm happy to send it to you. But these will give you the definitions of, you know, what a displaced homemaker is, what an ex-offender is, that kind of stuff. Uh, institutional programs, are they in a correctional facility, community, or other institutional? Um, again, you'll notice these are the same, hopefully the same three as 
the location information or the location page. Um, again, if, a, if you mark a class as in a location that is a correctional facility and you didn't mark it um, as if you didn't mark a student as in a correctional facility we will automatically mark them as a correctional in a correctional facility as they are taking a class in that location so again with those locations just you want to make sure that the whole facility or that the whole location is identified as one of these Partner agencies. If a student is working with a partner agency, you will want to identify which partner agency the student is working with. Um, are they working with DWS, VR, UDC? What are they work? Who are they working with? Um, in the upcoming future, we are going to be giving access to these agencies to pull students that are identified as uh, whatever agency they're working in through. So, for example, if you have a DWS uh, agent that you are that students are that a DWS person will be able to log into UASIS, find just their students, and they'll be able to then um, view the information for inside of UASIS. So the whole email chain back and forth or phone calls of, hey, get I, we need this information. Those should slowly be going out of the window as we do get this, bring this on board. Again, though, this is probably not going to happen until probably December, January time period. So it's not going to be an immediate fix right now. Uh, but we are working on programming to give these partner agencies access into the system. Uh, intake, uh, the last thing is intake contact hours. So we want to, we're collecting how many hours they did intake. Now intake can be uh, intake orientation, uh, counseling, kind of whatever you identify as intake. We do break all of those different hours into their own individual fields, but you are welcome to add all of those into here as one set of intake hours. You'll notice that we have an eight hour max down here at the bottom. Uh, you'll also be able to change this intake date if you need to. Um, so if, for example, the student started on 7-1, I wanna be able to date that all the way back to 7-1, I can do so. Um, I'm gonna say that the student also took three hours of intake to be able to identify all of that, um, but that is, um, but that's that's OK. Um, you will be able uh, to count all of these hours, or I should say all of these hours for intake. Um, do count towards the student's first 12 for the period of participation. Um, so that is really crucial on why we collect them. Also, we do collect these at the end of um, or at the beginning of each year, rather we report them to DWS as how many intake hours and um, testing hours our students are doing on a yearly basis. So we do want to start getting this as, a, as an accurate number for all of our students. Once I have all of my pieces in here that are required, I'll go ahead and hit save. I'll say that my status and barriers have been updated. I can then go back. Now that my student, now that I've entered my status and barriers, you'll see that my icon up at the very top is disappeared. At this point, the student is fully enrolled. Um, you'll also notice that I have a total of three hours. I mentioned that those three hours for intake do count towards the student's first 12. This is where that shows up, or this is where you can partially, where you can see that. But you'll see that this, those total hours do start um, collecting there. Um, okay, uh, before we go on to additional students, I do want to show you kind of how the process works for existing students. Um, it's very, very similar. So I'm going to go ahead and go back, um, go back, and I'm going to go ahead and search for an existing student. So I'm going to come in here. I'm going to search for the last name of ELL and the first name of Doug, for example. I'm going to hit search, and here is any student that is as close to these names as I can. Um, as I scroll down, again, I only have a few options, but they are all in alphabetical order. So if I know that the last name was Ellerman, for example, I will be able to find it. So I find one here is my uh, Douglas Ellerman, for example. I'll look and I have a birth date. Those both match. I just want to do a quick double check to make sure other things are matching up. Um, so, you know, I can come down here to my demographics. I can say, OK, is this your home address or did you live here? Um, if they mentioned yes, I can verify is this your uh, phone number as well, uh, birth date. I can just verify all this information. And if this is my student that I want, I can enroll the student into my program. 
So I would come up here to my enroll in programs. I'm going to select my begin date, and we're going to say the student started on August 1st. And we'll see the student's been added to my program. I don't need to add any other program types to the student. I'm going to hit back. We will see that up at the top, we'll see that I need to do my status and barriers. So I'm going to go ahead and click that. The student's not a refugee. We're going to say that they're unemployed, searching for job right now. If they add any sort of uh, um, barriers, so we're going to say that this student is a long-term unemployment. Uh, long-term unemployment, you'll see, is a participant who's been unemployed for 27 or more consecutive weeks. Uh, and we're going to say the student is uh, low income and exhausting TANF. Again, these barriers are self-reported. So if the, the student doesn't identify as one of these, then you're not going to mark it. Um, but if the student clicks or checks one of those, then you can go ahead. Uh, they're not working with any, but we're going to say that they're working with DWS. Uh, I'm going to push this contact date back to 8-1. The student took two and a half hours, and I'm going to hit save. My status and barriers have been updated up at the top. I'll hit back. And now the student is enrolled in my program. So the process to enroll an existing student is very, is, it's very, very uh, similar to the way a, a new student is. Um, the last thing you would want to do on an existing student is I'm going to update my demographics. So maybe, for example, the student no longer lives here, uh, but we're going to say they end up living on, we're going to say 27 for 12 West. Uh, we're going to go 4200 South. Uh, we're going to keep it Salt Lake. We're going to keep everything else the same. Phone number still good. And I'm going to end up saving. Um, and that's how I will update my demographics. So updating demographics for an existing student is the last piece that you'll want to do um, before you start doing testing in classes. But that's that's your process for enrolling an existing student. Um, pretty simple, pretty easy. Everything from here on out, whether it's an existing student or a brand new student, will be the exact same process. Um, there isn't really going to be anything that changes too drastically. Um, so we're going to go ahead and go back. I'm going to go to my student that I created and we're going to go ahead and we're going to add some tests. So once I give a student some tests, I'm going to come in here to the student test page. This is what a brand new student looks like. An existing student may have some additional pops that they have. And so they may have some additional uh, tests that you can look at. But again, it's not required for you. It's, it, it's, it's not going to affect how you enter brand new tests. So up here in the corner, I'm going to hit add new test. And then I'm going to be quiet. And then I'm going to ask, you know, what tests are they going to give? So in this case, we're going to say that the student took a CASAS test. Uh, they took it back on, you know, we're going to say they took it on the 8th. The proctor is who gave the test. Uh, we are wanting to collect this information as we want to just verify that every staff member that is giving, say, CASAS tests are CASAS certified. Um, as we do come out for program monitoring, uh, we will verify this information. So uh, do keep in mind that we we're, we're going to be double checking that. So I'm going to say that Katrina is the one who proctored this test. Uh, the assessment, is it a reading or a math goals? This is a reading. Uh, which form is it that the student has? So we're going to say a form B, 903R. Uh, you'll see down here at the bottom, we have a min and a max score for our tests. So we're going to say the student scored a 216. And the testing time here, you'll see, is optional. Um, so if you've added it into, say, your intake hours, you're not going to want to add it into here to double, but you are welcome to add the, con the testing hours in here um, if you would, if you want. Um, so, and again, you can do this one of two ways for testing. So if the student took both the reading goals and the math goals too, for example, um, grand total wise, they say they took an hour and a half. I can enter an hour and a half here. And, but when I enter my math goals, I'm not going to want to put in a testing time. But if, for example, I say that the student took, say, a half hour on the reading goals um, and 45 minutes on the math goals, I can enter those separately. However, as long as the test was done on the same day, the system will add those hours together. So um, that's how that's how the testing time works. 
So we're going to add the testing time in here. You'll see a couple things change as we do add these tests. So up at the top here, I will see which test it is. Now this right here shows you which last test in that subject area the student was given. So in reading goals, you'll see that the student was last given uh, Form B uh, 903R. Um, that is something that you that, that you'll be able to see on all students as you do go through these. Uh, you'll also see how many hours they've had since their last test. So um, it just kind of gives you quick information. <coughs> Excuse me. On each of the individual tests, if I wanted to see more <coughs> more detailed information, I can come down here to my pop date. I can click on that and we will now see that the more detailed so I can see exactly the date, uh, which program gave it my score, uh, who proctored it, um, as well as what level it was. Now this level gain, it will be um, does from test to test um, and tests. Uh, so if the student takes a post test in reading goals and scores an ABE level three, that one will show a level gain. Um, I'll show you what those post tests kind of look like in a little bit. Um, you will see the little star icon here uh, with the exclamation that shows you who created it on, on when. Uh, we'll see who last modified it. Again, those may be the same. They may be different. Maybe I entered the score incorrectly and three days later, uh, one of my colleagues did enter it for me. Um, I have an edit and a delete option here. So one thing, these tests are not approved. So once I enter a test, it doesn't need to be approved before level gains or before an entering EFL shows up on a student. Um, the one caveat with that is you cannot edit or delete uh, a past test if there's a more uh, recent test on there. Meaning that if I if this student took a reading goal, say C, for example, a 905R, I couldn't delete this reading goals as it has to do, it's an older test. And again, that all has to go back to calculations on level gains and different things like that. I'm not gonna allow you to modify an old test and have to try to redo all the calculations on the fly. Um, if you need to modify an old test, you're gonna have to delete the most recent one, modify the old one, and then re-enter the new, re-enter the most recent. Um, that process hasn't changed since the old system. Um, we still have to do that if there were questions uh, or, or, or problems with ex old tests, is they have to be done that way. So um, with tests, one thing you'll notice is I do enter new tests, for example, um, I have both CASA CSL and TABSL as well as all of my uh, ABE tests. You can mix and match tests um, between uh, ESL and ABE. So if an, e if an ESL student came in, took the ESL test, you can also give them, say, the math test, as we do want to see all ESL students get math tests. Um, the way the entering functioning level works on that is ES ELLs or ESL levels will take precedence over ABE levels. So if the student has an ESL level test this program year, that will become precedent over the ABE test. Um, so if they were in ESL 5, for example, but their math was an ABE level 2, uh, ESL 5 will take precedence over the 2, uh, even though it looks like the 2 is technically lower, ESL does take precedence. Um, if you have questions on that, please reach out. We're happy to kind of talk with and explain exactly how some of that works, but that's how you can kind of mix and match. Again, there's no needing to change a student's contact type to make sure that I can switch the student from ESL to ABE. As soon as the student is ready to move up to ABE, you give them the test, come in here and enter it. And then the following year, as you move into the new program year and the student's still with you, their functioning level will change to ABE automatically as the system will then see that there are new uh, ABE tests that will override the, any of the ESLs. The only exception is math. Math will never override an ESL test. That's the only one that is the exception. Uh, okay, so that's entering tests. And again, uh, please verify. Uh, the one big thing that I've I, I've seen is that, hey, I have a question. You know, I have a student that I'm not able to enter a specific test for. Um, in this case, if I tried to enter another 903R for this student, that's not valid. Um, you cannot give the same test form two times in a row. So if you do try to enter the test, 
do a couple do do a couple checks before you you send up a message. One is the test already entered. I've seen that on a couple of them that there was just a miscommunication between uh, users and that the tests had already been entered, and so you don't need to do that. Two, double check and see you know if this is a post test. Did we accidentally give the wrong test? No, there is no way to override the system to allow a second 903R in this case to be entered into the system. That test is invalid and the student will need to retest. Um, that, so that is something you'll want to double check as you give pre's and post tests is make sure you are giving the right form to the student that it is an alternate form as that goes against every testing protocol that you cannot give to um, two in the same uh, in the same uh, order. OK, um, so that's all of our testing. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about adding students to classes. Um, so once we've enrolled a student into our programs, maybe we have or haven't given them a test, but we're going to want to enter them into classes. Um, entering them simply into your program does not automatically enter them into any classes. You'll notice up here at this top right here, it says currently enrolled in classes, none. Um, if a student is not enrolled in any classes, you can't give trans or you can't enter any sort of credits that they earned and you can't enter attendance for the student. So you'll need to enroll them into a class. Uh, fifth option down on this on this side is classes. If you click on that, uh, you'll see five options up at the top. First one is currently enrolled. Are they currently enrolled in any classes? Um, you could see the list here if they are. Uh, the second one is our program classes. This is where we enroll students into our class. So if this student comes in, I know that I'm going to put them into this Katrina class one. I'm going to click this little add class icon. It's going to ask me two questions. What's the placement date and what seat type are they taking over? So the student started way back on the 1st, but because they tested on the 8th, maybe they didn't start until the 9th. Uh, whatever the scenario happens to be, please make sure you change that placement date, um, especially if you're backdating it. That really drives where you can add hours for the student uh, in, in when you start entering uh, contact hours. Uh, the second question is, what seat type? are they taking? Are they taking an in-person or an online seat? The default will be on in-person for most programs. Um, and I would probably say that probably 90 to 95% of our students are gonna be take, taking an in-seat person or an in-seat class. Um, so that is what the second question. This override class lock wait list is only available to some uh, users, it is a permission. Um, so say, for example, that this class had the 25 max inside of there that I wanted, but I got the OK from the teacher and the program admin said we're OK. I'm going to enroll the student as a 26th. I can override the walk waitlist class and automatically enroll this student. Again, that will only matter if you actually deal with uh, waitlist. If your classes are all unlimited, you'll never have to worry about that. So we're going to go ahead and save the student into here. Now, one thing you'll notice, so it says we're successful up at the very top, but you'll notice that the icon here on the Katrina class has now it changed to enrolled. Uh, it's now a little uh, chair, and it shows that the if I hover over it, it shows that they're enrolled and that it's a, they're, they're taking up an in-person seat. Uh, so let's say, for example, I'm going to enroll the same student into this class 42 online. Uh, I'm going to update them back as well. However, I'm going to have them take an online seat. So they're going to go through Zoom or uh, UENs or whatever uh, software, but they're going to take this uh, for, through an online seat instead. So if I'm going to say that they're taking that online seat, I'm going to enroll them in there. You'll see that it's now a little computer screen instead of a seat. Still shows that they're enrolled. It just identifies which seat the student is taking. Um, we have these icons throughout the system. So it is something that you'll be able to see. Um, we do have a search class up here. So if your list is really long and you know the name of the class, you can do the class up here. So if I want to go see three POs, for example, I can start typing and it filters out who those, what those classes are. This state online allows you to enroll the student into any of these state online courses that other programs are offering. 
So um, when I updated this, you see that Granite had a lot of these classes. They were GPLC track classes. And if you scroll down, there's a lot of these that I can enroll. If I enroll any one of my students in here, a couple of things you want to see. One, when I click on that, it will ask you to have you contacted the program. It's a simple yes and no question. But we want to verify that if you are enrolling a student into the state online course, that you have contacted the program to let them know I want or I have a student interested. That just lets the, pro the, the program know as well as the program can let the teacher know that, hey, by the way, you have a student coming in from a different program, so keep an eye, and then they can run you know, a class list and figure out names and other things like that. Uh, when I hit yes, it asks for my class placement date when I want to, and it asks the only option I have are seat online as the student who is taking it from a different program, the only option is an online program. A um, couple of things that will happen when you do the state online. Um, if you enroll a student on the state online, it will automatically enroll a student into that uh, program, assuming they don't already have an existing uh, open enrollment. So if this student, for example, I wanted to enroll them into this class, I'm going to say yes that I've enrolled them. I'm going to date them back to say the July 22nd as an online and I hit save. What happened just happened with this student is the student is now enrolled in both Granite and in my test program. So if I cancel out of here, you will see that I now have a Granite enrollment as of July 22nd, which is the date that they started in the class. So that's how the state online enrollments work. There is no automatic unenrollment in the classes right in the class right now. We figured that if a student said, hey, I really like that class, I want to take session two with them, or I want to take the next level um, in, in the in in the in the order. I don't want to have to have a bunch of these enrollments and unenrollments that just kind of just clog up the students' enrollment. So if they're enrolled in the program, they're enrolled till either the pro that program goes in and separates the student, or I go in or until the 90 days happens, one of the two. So those are going to be what ends up happening um, when we use the or when we do these state online uh, classes. Um, let me go back to classes, just show a couple other things. One, you'll notice that um, here are all my currently enrolled. So I've got my name of my class. I've got when they've done, which seat they've on, and which hours they are. Um, these little X icons, if you hover over them, you'll see that, that was we can remove them from the class. Um, now, when you remove them from a class, one of two things will happen. If the student has contact hours in the class, we'll put an end date on the last date that the student attended the class and we'll just move the student from currently enrolled to past enrolled and you'll still have the record there if the student has zero hours like this student like this class does then if i remove the from the from, if i remove them from that class it actually completely removes the record that the student was ever enrolled because if a student has zero hours we saw no reason to leave that the student did have a record or tried to attempt to make it. So that's how the remove from class functionality ends up working. Uh, but that this is the place in which you remove students from a class. Um, again, we'll see the little person icon here that shows you who last modified them. So if there was any sort of modifications, um, that's where it is. Uh, the wait list icon here, if they do, if they're in a wait list, this will show you which uh, classes the student has that they're on wait list and in which order they are. We do number them based on a first come first serve basis. So even though this student's last name is little and they're in the L's, they may be first on the list versus someone who has an A or someone who has say a smaller number. We went first come first serve all based on how you guys enroll the students. Uh, the last one is, of course, is past enrolled. The student doesn't have any past enrolled, but this would show uh, very similar to the currently enrolled. It'll show the name of the class along with the begin and end date. It will show you what kind of type of seat they have, and it will show you the number of hours the student had. Uh, since we imported everything over, there is that possibility that students may have zero hours in there as the old system did not separate uh, 
or did not delete a record of that student being in the class. So you may still see those in some of the pass and rolls, but at least moving forward, um, if that happens, then you won't actually see anything. All right, so now that we have students enrolled, we now see up at the top here in this currently enrolled, we'll see, hey, the student is in Granite and it ha they have a class here. They're in my program and uh, are in my test program and they're in this class and they're in the Katrina's class. I'll see that he they're in the Katrina seat class, but they're online for both of these other two. Again, just giving you the quick information about what the student is and kind of the where where they're at. Uh, for all of those pieces of information. Um, all right, let's go over attendance quick. Um, there's two ways to do attendance inside of the system. One is by class. So if I cancel out, I come over to class. Um, I'm going to come to this Katrina's class. I'm going to click on add, uh, the three little ellipses and add hours. You'll see that I have students uh, I only have my one student in here. Um, their name is hyperlinked in case you need to go back to their name for or, or their record for whatever reason. A um, couple of things on here. This, these contact hours only show two weeks at a time. Um, so it'll you pull whatever the most recent date is um, that was available for the class. In this case, this was a Monday, Wednesday, uh, Friday class. Today is Thursday, so today's date does not show up. Um, so I will see that yesterday for two hours, anything in blue is an independent hour. Those would be the, the um, what you guys know as your distance hours or your proxy hours. So anything that the student does outside of normal class hours can be entered inside of there. Um, you simply click inside of there, enter the number of hours, tab off of it, or just click off of it, and you'll see that the student contact hour is saved. If I have to jump back, so say, for example, I get behind on my hours. I need to jump a couple of weeks back. I'm going to click this drop down and I'm going to go back to July 1st, for example. I'm going to hit go to. I apologize. That's usually working. I will figure out what's going on. What will happen is that go to ends up. Um, changing this first begin date to the closest date that the student started inside of there, and it will go two weeks out. We never show more than two weeks at a time, um, and so that will allow you, that way you don't overload this page with too much information, um, but you'll just go through and you can enter hours. Um, in the old, if, if you ever have to go over the amount, the total amount of hours, say for example, a student had 2.5 hours inside of that day, that's fine. Just enter the amount of hours. You notice we will highlight it red. However, it still says that it's successfully saved. Um, that just lets you know that what it does is it allows you to see that, hey, this student has more than what I, I said a normal student would have. And that's okay. We're simply just letting you guys know. You'll see up here that the maximum live hours is 12 hours. So if I tried to put 20 in here, for example, so I'll put two and a zero, it automatically jumps me back down to 12. Um, I'm going to jump back to 2.5. Um, you'll also see my max independent hours. So my blue hours are a maximum of 100 hours a week. These independent hours show up weekly. Um, so they should show up every Saturday. Thank you, Alex. Um, this class started on August 19th, um, goes through September 30th. Um, and so that's why I can't jump any further back. Um, I probably ought to program in the begin and end or this drop down date where it doesn't allow you to select anything before the program's begin date. Um, but that's why I can't jump further than uh, the 19th. So um, that's how you enter the hours for uh, a whole class. Now, if I wanted to enter hours, I can have the ability to enter hours on an individual basis. So let me go back to my student. I'm going to click on attendance, for example. And now if I look at here, I've got uh, the two classes that they're enrolled in my program. Yes, they're still enrolled in Granite, but I don't have control over Granite's programs uh, classes. So they have to enter all the hours in for them. But I'm going to look at this and I'm going to say, oh, the student also had an hour as of this date on this date as well. So I can enter my hours on a on a on a uh, um, individual basis. 
Green on here is a little different than what the old one is. Those are our regularly scheduled class dates. So you'll see this class is taught Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, this class is Monday, Wednesday, Friday, for example. Um, again, if I needed to jump backwards for whatever reason, I'll jump back to the eighth. A um, couple of things you'll notice. So one, uh, I now have grayed out boxes as on Katrina's class. Um, the reason why is because the class was not taught on that day. Um, so th that's that's limiting what I can do. Um, so if they're grayed out, that means the student wasn't active or the class wasn't active on those dates and those hours cannot be entered in. Um, you will also see my assessment, counseling, intake, orientation and tutoring hours are all on these days. You'll see my half hour of, it, uh, of assessment on this date. Um, if I jumped back to the first, for example, you'll end up seeing that my intake hours are three hours on that date. So those are the that's where you can enter those other hours. Um, so intake and um, assessment can be entered on their pages. Counseling, orientation, and tutoring have to be entered onto this page. Um, you also have the attendance history currently on this page. I say currently because we plan to move it onto its own little tab. Um, if, you will be able to run the attendance history for any student uh, that is in that has been in your program so that you can pull what their hours have been, uh, whether that's for parole or whether for DWS, whatever it happens to be, you will be able to do it. So we are going to move this. It's currently here, but it will be moving probably in the next week or two. Um, so that's entering attendance uh, for our students. Uh, let's talk quickly about transcripts. Um, so to enter transcripts, we're going to click on the transcript page. On here, we've got a couple of things. Um, so if there's a, they have a graduation date, it'll show up at the very top. Um, if they have or have not passed their civics test, it'll show here. We enter the civics test on another page. I'll show that one in a little bit. Graduation summary. This is a drop down, open, close field. Um, red on this page or this little maroon color, whatever you want to call it, means that the student is missing information on that uh, graduation area. Um, you will see all of the sub areas are also broken out down on the bottom. So you'll see I, the student here has a language arts, needs one credit, has one or has zero credits. Um, all of our credits will show up down at the bottom as we do start to enter those. If I want to enter a credit, I'm going to hit add a new. And then I, my first question is, what credit type do you want? In this case, uh, I have an adult education, trans high school transcript. Uh, work experience, whatever. In this case, I'm going to enter a high school transcript. So the student, this student had a high school transcript. We're going to say test school. The credit year is looking for a four digit year. So for example, the 22-23 school year would be 2023. I'm going to say this is 2019. Uh, the grade they were in, uh, again, this is nine through adult education. So we're going to say the students in 10th grade and the course name. Again, this has to be identical to what is on the, on the transcript. So we're going to say this is LA 10, for example. Graduation area. Uh, where am I wanting to put this? So I'm going to say language arts. This is an LA 10 graduation area. Credit per term. If I look at the credit and they have four terms and they've uh, earned, say, a full credit, we know that the credit per term is at a quarter credit. Attempted is usually going to be the exact same as here. The only exception is going to be if the student fails a different term. So we're going to say that the student is an A, 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 and we're going to say that they failed uh, term four, for example. Um, we'll show you what that does in just a minute. And then we have comments. If I need to make any sort of comments, I can do that. I have a save and clone option. When I hit save and clone, what it'll do is it'll save everything in there, keep my school, my credit year, and my grade. So now I can write, for example, seg, uh, sorry, seg math one. And I can identify that this was, is going into my Sec Math 1 at a quarter credit uh, for each of the terms um, at an A, B, A, A, and I'm going to save that. A couple of things we'll see when we do save this. Um, again, so this Language Arts 10, for example, that we had, if you remember, I put an F in there. And if I look at here, I have an F. My, I did not, the system did not save a quarter of an hour of earned credit, but it did save a 0 0.25. That's what it was looking, to, that's what we're expecting to do. Um, so that is something that we uh, want to make sure does happen. Um, there are certain grades uh, that do automatically zero out. 
um, so that in case you do enter those in, uh, that you do see that. Uh, you'll see the little star and the little person here, for example. Uh, those are show you who last created and who last modified, um, as well as I can edit and delete uh, transcripts. Now, you can only edit and delete your transcripts. So since I'm the one entering these, if Granite, for example, were to go ahead and go in, they would not be able to delete these transcripts. The only thing that they may be able to do is edit the transcripts and change the graduation area. So we do limit on what you can edit and delete depending on whether you are the one who uh, edited the, or who you are the one, you're the program who entered the transcript. Um, to enter a high school or an adult education credit, I'm going to enter new. I'm going to come to adult education, and it's going to ask me very similar such questions. A couple things change. So what adult education class is it? If I click the class, you'll see that I have two options. Um, both of these classes um, can give credit. I made sure when I built the class that I identified that the class can give credit. Also, you'll see that I don't have that other credit class. I don't have any other credit classes. If this program was teaching any, this drop down will only show classes that the student is currently enrolled in. Um, so keep that in mind as you're trying to award credit that the student needs to be enrolled in the course and the course needs to be identified as being able to give credit. Then in here in my course, I'm going to select which core or which graduation uh, or which K-12 course it is. So I'm going to say the student was a language. We're going to finish out language arts 10. Um, so I'm going to select language arts 10. The credit date is what date did they earn it? Did they earn it today? Did they earn it last week? I'm going to say that they earned it on the 19th. They are going to because it's a language arts 10. The system knows that it either goes into language arts or elective. The graduation sub area, I'm going to identify it as language arts 10. Uh, then we're going to say, what did they earn per term? Uh, so I'm going to say that they earned a quarter credit and they attempted a quarter credit. Now, for whatever, we're going to say the student did take two terms worth of information during that time and passed both term one and term two at an A. Now, if I go ahead and hit save in here, we will see that the language arts 10 saved successfully. You'll see that the source name uh, is the uh, my test program. We'll see that the grade is adult education. Um, one thing you'll notice though, is if I look at term one, it saved it under language arts, language arts 10. If I look at term two, it automatically moves it into elective. The reason being is if I look at this, we had a core, we had three quarters of a credit here. Um, that were good for language arts 10. So when the system went ahead and saved term one here, it said, oh, language arts 10 is still needed. I'm going to add everything inside of term one. Then when term two went to be saved, the system looked and said, oh, language arts 10 is full. I'm going to automatically move any of these language arts, uh, any of these credits into electives. So the system automatic does not allow you to overfill any area, but will allow will automatically moves any of it to uh, elective. Um, if you look at um, any of these other court credits, for example, so work experience, they're all very similar. Work experience would be the same. The date is going to be defaulted to today, but you can always date that back. Work experience can only be CTE or elective along with the sub area. Uh, and then the work experience. So we're going to say that this student earned a full credit. I can make any sort of comment. So for example, they, this was a W-2 from AutoZone, for example. Uh, and then I can either save or clone, or I can just save it. If I save it, you'll see that I now have a work experience that was earned on August 29th in my program. One thing you'll notice is because I made a comment, you'll see a little comment icon. If I hover over it, that will show you any comments that were made about this transcript. So this would, for example, was a W-2 from AutoZone. Um, if I start looking at my graduation summary, you'll see I have secondary math one done because that was a transcripted credit. Language arts is now done because between the two. Um, CTE has the full credit in there. And you'll now see that I have a quarter credit in language arts giving me a grand total of 3.25. Um, once I have my credits, maybe the student wants an official or unofficial transcript. We have two options for that. We, you can pr print your unofficial transcript. If I click on that, you'll see it's watermarked as unofficial across 
Um, but all my information is still the same there. It also shows any of uh, the grades that they've earned um, that you've put inside of there. One thing it is missing is it's missing all of its signatures down at the bottom. So you're not able, you can print this off, give it to a student. It's watermarked as unofficial, but there are no uh, uh, signatures across the board. Um, if I go ahead and want to print them an official transcript, maybe they're moving, whatever the situation happens to be, I can click print official transcript. Uh, I can then see it's the exact same information all on here. I have my summary. So here's my cumulative credit. Here's my GPA as well. You'll notice now down at the bottom, I do now have my signatures that I can end up doing. So this would, I would click this little cloud icon up in the corner that will download a PDF to my computer and then I can print the PDF from there. So those are our transcripts. That's where we're going to do. That's where you do everything. Um, once we have our transcripts, now we're going to want to potentially uh, make any sort of achievements. So, for example, the student came in, they have their uh, civics exam. I'm going to click on achievements and I'm going to click on Utah achievements. And then I'm going to right now click on the drop down for a civics test and I'm going to put in the date. Uh, this date is not locked by this program year as we are allowing you to enter it either uh, if you see a date on the student's transcript back when they took it in high school or whatever, you can actually enter that date. Maybe they don't have a date, so you'd want to enter either the date that they had uh, brought in their transcript, gave it to you, or maybe the date that they enrolled in the program. Uh, whatever the situation happens to be, go ahead and enter the date that the student was um, had the civics test. I'm going to go ahead and hit save. We'll see that it's saved successfully. If I look at civics tests, we'll see that I have a date. I'll have my program and I can see who was entered by. Uh, ignore this little MA at the beginning. It's a, a small glitch inside of the system. We are getting fixed soon. Um, if I now come back to my transcripts, for example, I will now see that my civics test has been changed to pass. So again, I don't need to give all of my users access to the achievements page to see if they've passed the civics exam. I can just let the, we just need to get um, all the training in and let users know that the civics test can be viewed as passed or not from this page. Um, under achievements as well, um, we have all these MSG achievements. These MSG achievements are uh, achievements that would count for an MSG. So the adult ed diploma and GED count as HSC MSGs. Uh, the other three, the passing technical exam progress towards and the secondary uh, or post-secondary transcript, those are all IET MSGs that a student must be an IET in order for those to count federally. Um, these other achievements, if you look at those, you'll see there's family literacy and IELCE is the name before. Uh, again, these will only count federal wise if the student is marked as family literacy or IELCE prior to that. Uh, the last thing on here is your post exit uh, post exit achievements. These are, say, your uh, post secondary achievements or they are your um, um, employment achievements. So as we do data matches and different things like that, this will populate. However, if you're if you're wanting to do this on a one-off basis, maybe you met the student in the store and they told you kind of where they're at right now, you can go ahead and mark these post-exit achievements as you get them completed. Um, we don't yet have any sort of um, outcome call list to do any of these in bulk, we are working on that. That will come over over the next month or so. Um, just give us, be patient with us as we finish up all of our federal reports. A um, couple last things with this is we have um, our notifications here. Notifications are a great way to add a quick note onto it so that any user inside of the system that for your program knows. So maybe for example, I want to say, you know, a student, uh, needs to post test. Um, next time they come in, um, I'll mark this as an. I'll, I'll keep this as an active. I'm going to hit save. You'll see that it's in there now. When I cancel, I get this kind of maroon um, icon on the student, and it lets them know that hey, there is something going on with this. Um, you will see who created and who last modified this. Um, if they come in and they complete that notification that, oh, hey, we're going to go ahead and post test them. So we're going to come into the tests. We're going to add new. We're going to give the student a test as of today. Uh, we're going to give them that reading form B. 
904, they make a 225, and they tested for, we're going to say a quarter, three quarters of an hour. Um, now that they have a test, for example, I can then come into my notifications. I can hit the little edit icon, mark, this, mark it as inactive, hit save. You'll see it reds it out. Now when I come back here, it's gone. A um, couple things as I did add those um, post tests, um, you'll see that I have a couple of check marks over on the side. Uh, if the student has um, an entering EFL, for example, we see the subject it is and which entering EFL it is. This student has an MSG, so there is an EFL gain along with the date that the student earned it, and I've got the check mark for post test. All right, so that's your notifications. Once we have a student completely done, um, now we're going to want to separate the student. So once we're done with a student, um, we will go into our enroll in programs. And the last thing um, we'll do is separate the student from our program. Now, the separation date inside of here is automatically filled. And if you try to change it, you won't be able to. The separation date is always going to be based on the student's last activity date. Uh, inside of the system. Now, activity inside of the system counts as contact hours. So contact hours can be, as, as you saw, we can add multiple types of contact hours. These contact hours will be testing or uh, class hours, whatever they happen to be, but the system automatically pulls that date. I'm going to then want to mark the reason that they are. So maybe this student is moving to a different location. Uh, maybe they're in my program and they're going to move up to maybe the Salt Lake Valley area. So they're going to end up doing that. So I'll mark that the student's moving to a new location. Um, this still incarcerated is really crucial for those that are work with jails and work with the prisons. You are going to want to identify whether the student is still incarcerated in or not. The reason it's important is this makes if the student is still incarcerated, it will pull them out of having to do um, all of our post exit uh, follow up on the students. So please make sure that as you are separating students, that they are going to be marked as whether they're still incarcerated or not. But if everything looks good here, I'm going to go ahead and hit separate. You'll see the student successfully separated. And if I go ahead and try to search for the student now, fix something. You will now see that my student no longer shows up as an active student. Um, if I went into search all students and I went ahead and did a search on uh, for that student, for example, um, I will find my student here. But you will now see that they are have an exit date and on my program, they are still active in Granite which is fine. They can still continue to do stuff. Maybe granted is the program that they're moving towards, whatever the situation happens to be, but the student is no longer active in my program. Um, last thing that I want to quickly talk about are uh, any of our reports and helps. So off on the side here, we have reports. Now we've got a lot of different reports and we will continue to build reports inside of the system as we do move um, everywhere. Uh, so you'll see uh, we have all of our federal reports. This uh, state performance report is a federal report as well. Uh, we also have our pre-test and post-test report. Um, we have our class list. Again, this is where you can run that class list if you do need it. Um, we also have student achievements, which it will show you any, all of the student achievements, which are diplomas, GEDs, and anything else on that student achievement place. Um, pending student demographics. Uh, for now, when I say for now, because this is eventually, this is going away, uh, if you change anything on the student's demographic page, it will need to be approved. Uh, so for example, you'll know, if you remember back when I enrolled uh, my Douglas student, I changed something on their demographics for, with their address. If I click into it, you'll see that I say, have an icon that simply says needs approval. Clicking on that doesn't do anything. It doesn't take you anywhere. Uh, what you'll do is you'll, you'll come into reports, come down to pending student report reports, and now I can see that my Douglas has uh, a va an old value and a new value. If that all looks good, I'm going to go ahead and hit approve. Now, with that said, one thing right now is that you have to do this with all student demographics. In the upcoming future, probably within the next month or so, 
uh, maybe probably October-ish time period, mid-October, we are going to get rid of uh, student demographics. So if you as users go ahead and change anything on the student's demographics, it's automatically going to be entered into the student system as good data. Um, we are still going to leave the process there for student demographics as we do want to pull um, uh, students will be able to change their own demographics in the student portal. So you will still have the capability of doing that. So the list, the, the report is still gonna stay there and the capability is still gonna be there. Just when you change it as a user, it's gonna automatically be essentially approved and put into the system. So give us a little bit of time um, that, so that will go away, but until then, that's how you will change any student demographics. So if you change last name, first names, um, change addresses, whatever it happens to be, please double check there, approve it, and then though, and then you, the student will be, should be good. Um, last thing I wanna show before we kind of open anything up for questions is our help desk. Um, if you click on help, you will see we have our webmaster email. Now, I have the webmaster email on here for anybody to, to, to email. I would say though that please, if you are a t not the director or the program admin, please talk to your directors and admins before you send an email to the webmaster as there's maybe is some communication that I've already sent out to them, uh, letting them know if, you know, an issue with the site itself, maybe an issue with a, a piece inside of it. Um, maybe I had an update going out, whatever the situation is, I do email them on a regular basis. So please double check with your admins before you do send that. Um, let them know that you are having an issue and if there's something that they're unaware of, they are welcome to email me. Uh, one feature we have inside of here is with this email. If you hover over this Oasis email, you can actually click and it copies it to your email. So for, uh, for example, I'll show you that it pay, if I paste it up, it gives me my whole uh, Oasis webmaster in the back end. Um, so that's where it is. For those that, um, uh, want just some how to's. We do some have some uh, how to documents created. We will eventually get them posted up on here where you can see them. But for now, we have them all loaded up into a Google folder. So if you click on this how th this here, um, this page will take you to a our Google folder which we have all these how to documents loaded up. And so you'll see here's all of our how-to documents. So if you had questions about enrolling a student um, into a class, for example, um, I can go through and I can open up that document. If I had questions about separating a student, I can open up that document. Up at the very top, you'll see I have all of my intake forms. If you double click onto that, you will see I have all of my intake forms in the languages um, that we had in the old system. Um, if you need the English version of it, I did upload the English version as well. Uh, I'm right there. Um, just double click on it. It opens up that. Then you can download, print it off, um, and use these. Use these. So we did upload all of the intake forms here for you guys to be able to use. Um, that is UASIS in an overarching 10,000 foot level. Um, I know that it was a lot of information very quickly. I'm hoping that you guys were being, being able to follow along. Um, we are going to post this up onto YouTube as well. Um, so keep that in mind. That way you can go back through and watch certain sections as we do go through um, and uh, follow along. Um, at this point, I will open it up. I didn't see any other uh, questions come uh, from the chat. Are there any questions that anybody has right now? If there's sp about a specific student, please email me. Um, if they're generalized questions, then I'm happy to answer them. Um, I do see that we do have um, adding student pictures. Um, as of right now, we're not able to upload any sort of information. We are working with our IT to get all this information in a location that we can both upload it um, and download and that you guys can download it. Um, for now, there's not that capability, but we are bringing that. Um, we, are, we are hoping student pictures for sure. The rest of the documents, honestly, we're still up in the air. We're waiting to hear back from IT. Uh, Robert, did you have a question? Uh, 
Um, if you're talking, you are muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can kind of hear you now. Go ahead. Or maybe not. I think you cut out again. Um, as you try to figure that out, you're welcome also to use the chat and enter it in there. Um, Bonnie asked uh, about entering transcripts on the eighth term, attempted to enter credit, and it wouldn't let me enter decimal, so this is a bug. Yes, Bonnie, um, I, we are recently aware of this. Um, we will be adding this to our upcoming fixes um, as we do get it. Um, I'm unsure why the code didn't copy all the way over to eighth term, but we will get that fixed. Um, we'll probably have that fixed by next week. That should be a really super simple fix. And that got um, next week. I'll let you know when that gets pushed. All right. Any others? Robert, I see you still have your hand up, but it seems like you're still not coming through clean. How do we know if we have permission to data match? Um, so you don't have permissions to data match. Oh. Um, and so data matching will all happen on my side. If you're talking about GED data matches, for example, um, those will be something that you have that will, um, I'll, I'll, I'll explain everything um, as we um, launch the GED data matching. Um, if you're talking about the employment or the post-secondary, that's not really a data match, that's just entering information. Um, and that would be this, you, you have permission to enter any uh, student achievements. Okay, any other questions? All right. So I think we'll go ahead and end there. Thank you so much for coming to today's delayed third Thursday. Um, we do plan on holding these third Thursdays uh, every month between now and May. Um, we will send out notices when those third Thursdays are happening. Also, when we get the dashboard up and running with the third Thursdays, we'll send out the link on there as well. Um, one last question that seems to come in, is there a place for the transcript to show the total credits earned? Yes, so if you want to see the total credits earned by a student, let me go ahead and jump, for example. Um, so if I jump to this, jump to my Douglas student, for example, if I go to transcripts, if I go to graduation summary, and if I go all the way down to the bottom, you'll see I have a total section right here. Uh, that will show you my grand total of uh, students our grand total of credits, for example. So um, we will be, I will let you, per, let you guys know before you guys jump off that we will be redoing a little bit of this of this transcript page. Um, there's been some feedback on it that's been really good. Um, and so we will be probably revamping this graduation page over the next little bit of time. Um, so we will push out notices when that does happen. But, so keep that in mind um, that this page will be happening. But if you do have additional feedback, we're always welcome to hear here um, and we will be pushing that in. Um, last thing that I'm going to share is that we are going, we are planning to bring our user group back um, to life. Um, we kind of uh, uh, ended it as the system came online. Uh, the user group is a group that helps us build the system, uh, helps us create uh, and, and, and spin new ideas off of people's feedbacks. Um, we are going to bring that back. Our first meeting is going to be during our fall conference. So if you've not yet signed up for the fall conference, please do so. Um, we will be holding that uh, the 
uh, first session of uh, the second day. Um, so keep that in mind if you are interested. We will also have a couple of, uh, we will have another session for just simply help um, in UASIS. So we will have a couple of things UASIS if you um, are interested. But again, that will be during our fall conference, which is uh, October 28th and 29th. Uh, there's been a couple of messages going out that Kimberly has sent. So uh, with that, thank you guys so much for coming today. Uh, we will get this posted up on our YouTube uh, channel over the next day or so. And let us know if you have any questions. Thanks.